Hello again, this is Pastor Rob Lee from Gardena Valley Assembly. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on our, uh, our special playlist for eschatology. Um, I think it's an opportunity for all of us to be able to stop and ponder uh, end times. And so that's why we're putting together this special video. In today's session, we're going to talk about the second coming of Christ. In our first session, we talked about how there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. I want to read a little excerpt uh, from our uh, 16 Fundamental Truths of the Assemblies of God. This is number 14, although we're going to do a, a, a special uh, teaching on uh, this particular belief, uh, I, I should say a fundamental truth, core doctrine, uh, in another session. I do want to read from this. It says, The second coming of Christ includes the rapture of all Christians, which is our blessed hope, followed by the visible return of Christ with his saints to reign on the earth for a thousand years. That thousand year millennial reign will be covered in another session. What we're going to talk about in this session is the second coming of Jesus. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to do there. First of all, I want to say the second coming of Jesus is an event that will precede the millennial reign of Christ. Um, and that event is the seven year tribulation period, which is concluded with the uh, second coming of Jesus. So the event that precedes the millennial reign of Christ is the seven-year tribulation period, which is concluded with the second coming of Jesus. I want to make that really clear so people understand the sequence of events. Now, we'll do a separate teaching on the tribulation, separate from the second coming of Christ. I'm simply trying to uh, do these sessions in a sequential order so that we can kind of follow some of the things that are going to be happening in these last days. Now, while the tribulation, again, will be discussed in another session, the second coming of Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom will occur before the millennial age. The Assemblies of God holds uh, to a premillennial view, which also will be discussed in another session. You may be watching this and you're saying, well, I'm not Assemblies of God. That's fine. We are, and so we're going to give you um, our perspective. And more specifically, as a, as a person, as a pastor, as a Christian, I believe what the Assemblies teaches. A little bit about myself, I was raised in the Assemblies of God, uh, trained, I was a Royal Ranger, I grew up in our, our youth groups and our Sunday schools and, and our college and career groups, I went to Assembly of God Bible College after receiving the call of God, I went to camps and, and all that, and now uh, as a man, um, now uh, over 30 years in ministry, over 30 years as a as a ordained Assemblies of God minister, I believe that um, God is uh, fulfilling his prophetic word to the church and we're seeing the soon return of Jesus Christ. I feel the Holy Spirit has prompted me very strongly to put together these uh, teachings for you. Um, I, I've shared this in another session. I do teach eschatology at our school of ministry, um, but I'm doing this to make this information available to anybody who has an interest in eschatology. And I'm gonna try and give you concise teachings uh, so that you have just b basic information to help you to have a better understanding of, of what's coming down the pike. So with that, get your Bibles out. We're going to go through, and we're going to study God's Word. So Matthew 24, it's a great place to, uh, to uh, go to when you're, uh, when you're studying eschatology. Uh, a lot of, we have a, a separate teaching just on Matthew 24 that we'll do in another session. I'm going to say that a lot because we have about 20 sessions that we're going to be doing probably more by the time this uh, adventure is over. I was going to write a book, and I decided with the pandemic going on, why don't we just make a bunch of videos? Seems like everybody else is doing stuff online, so here we are. Okay, Matthew 24, go to verse 29, and it says this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So let's break this down. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, this speaks when Jesus will return to the earth. Now if you're a post-tribulation rapture theorist, then you use this passage and say, see, it says it right there, Jesus is coming in the rapture after the tribulation. But again, this is the second coming. That's a separate advent from the rapture of the church. 
And if you're new to eschatology or you are a, a student of eschatology, you need to really understand the difference between the rapture and the second coming. Because if you can't get that right, none of the rest of your eschatology is going to work. Now, I want to remind people, not the rapture, this is the second coming of Christ, his visible, physical return to the earth. Now, John the Revelator describes the second coming of Jesus this way. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19, and we'll start with verse 11. So, Revelation 19, verse 11. We're going to be going through Scripture pretty regularly. Usually, I'd have them all pre-tabbed, but I realize if I have them pre-tabbed, it doesn't give you opportunity to look up in your Bible. So, this is an opportunity for you to look in your Bible and to, to see where things are at. All right, Revelation chapter 19. Let's pick it up at verse 11 and following. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped with blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses." Now out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, that he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he, is, and he has on his robes and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and, gra come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of I saw and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Wow, what a radical and most dramatic entrance that Christ makes in his second coming. To best understand the second coming of Jesus, we understand it, we must understand it in relation to the tribulation. The tribulation lasts exactly 2,520 days. That's seven times 360 days. It begins the day the Antichrist signs a peace treaty with Israel. And it ends the day Jesus returns with his glorious church. That's you and I to retake the earth. Jesus doesn't set foot down on the plains of Megiddo. He returns to the Mount of Olives to do that. Jesus just speaks the word, and the armies amassed in Megiddo will be killed, and the devil will be sequestered. So when you read this passage, John is seeing Christ coming down from heaven on this white stallion. I know people have a hard time with flying horses, but in relation to everything else that God has done, flying horses is rather minimal. Because you and I will also be riding with him and the armies of the hosts of heaven. And when you see the phrase, a sword goes out of his mouth, it's not that a literal sword is going out of his mouth, it's just that he's speaking the word, and these armies are being destroyed. Now the beast and the false prophet, that's the Antichrist and the false prophet, um, are captured. These are the physical men, and they're cast into the lake of fire. Now right now the lake of fire is empty. There's nobody in there, because everybody goes to Gehenna, which is uh, in the earth. So they'll be the first two cast into the lake of fire, and there they'll be tormented. Um, so their judgment has come. When you, when you read the phrase, the word of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, listen, this is Jesus Christ. Any scholar worth half his salt, half his salt can see that. And he's coming back, and he's going to retake the planet. It's as simple as it could possibly be. So reading this passage gives the reader hope that we know that Jesus Christ will return one day in his second coming. And... You and I who have been raptured are coming back with him. So it's important that we understand that. Okay, let's go to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14. Now remember, we're talking about the second coming of Jesus. So I'm going to go through ser uh, several passages that um, reveal the second coming of, of Jesus. And so Zechariah 14, and we're going to just pick up verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. 
Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half shall move towards the south. And so we see here a picture of the great day of the Lord, where, where the Lord actually puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. Now, if you recall, when Jesus was uh, preaching um, 40 days after his resurrection, he was uh, raptured off the Mount of Olives. It was a slow rapture, a visible rapture, where he kind of floated up into the air as he was preaching, and people can see him. And then the angels appeared and said, hey, this, this man will come back just the way he left. So we see the fulfillment of that. It's going to be a great day of mourning and a great day of rejoicing. Uh, it's a great day of restoration and a great day of judgment when Christ comes back. It all depends on, on where you're at and what you believe. For everyone who took the mark of the beast and followed after the Antichrist, it's a great day of judgment. Because if they take the mark of the beast, then they're doomed. They cannot, um, they cannot be saved because they took the mark of the beast. For everyone who resisted the Antichrist and remained faithful to the Lord, it's going to be a day of restoration, a great day of rejoicing. So it all depends on, on where those people are at. And this will be decided at the judgment of the nations, which will occur in Jerusalem. I'll give you a separate teaching on the judgment of the nations in another video, because we don't hear a lot of teaching on that, and people are kind of confused as to what it is. Um, as a matter of fact, why don't I just do it right now, and then you'll have it. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. You know, when I was a kid in Sunday school, we used to do sword drills, and I was, I was not quite as fast as some of the students, but I was pretty fast, and I'm finding myself doing sword drills with you right now, so I hope you appreciate that. Praise God. Okay, so Matthew 25, and for the sake of time, let's go to verse 31. It says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Listen, if I can just give you a little Rob Lee commentary here. You never want to be on the left side of Jesus. You always want to be on the right. Just remember that. Okay, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Then he says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. This is a good word here. And I was in prison, and you came to me. Well, then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when do we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, as much as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. In context, he's speaking to a group of people who have just went through the seven-year tribulation and survived it. It's a powerful picture. Now, on this side of the rapture, yeah, we're going to be judged with the same uh, type of uh, litmus test, for lack of a better word. But it's much more difficult to do these things when the entire planet is under duress. So you know there's going to be trip saints out there that are struggling and surviving. And they're going to be looking out for people and taking people in and loving people and being Jesus for these people. These people will be recognized at the judgment of the nations by Jesus himself. It's a powerful picture. Now, he goes on to verse 41. He says, Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no drink. I was thirsty and you gave me I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And they will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them and say, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to, the, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And then he, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but to the righteous into everlasting life. Here we see all the people on the face of the earth being gathered into Jerusalem uh, to be judged by Jesus. Anyone who has taken the mark of the beast and um, 
and not accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord will be cast into hell to await their final judgment at the great white throne judgment at the end of time. The great white throne judgment, another study. Anyone who was faithful to the Lord and received his forgiveness, those who resisted the Antichrist by not taking his mark or adhering to uh, his belief system, will be welcomed into Christ's millennial kingdom. Now people often say, how in the world are you going to get everybody on the planet into Jerusalem? I mean, come on, Pastor Rob, how is it even possible? Here's how it works. God is literally going to dispatch angels throughout the entire planet and gather everybody and collect them to be amassed in Jerusalem. And you might think that's a lot of, uh, a lot of people to be in one small area, but you have to understand after the tribulation, the planet will be decimated. There'll be far few pe fewer people left on the planet to, to be able to do that. Um, I have another teaching on angel flight that describes how that works because right now we don't see the logic of that. But when we're raptured, the theory is, is that an angel comes and grabs us and takes us up instantaneously. So all the people that are raptured actually get to heaven by an angel grabbing them and taking them up. Now, you may not see the angel. Um, it's an, an immediate, he grabs you and poof, you're, you're in heaven, just like that. So, it sounds like something out of X-Men or something, but, but the truth is, as we're going to get there that fast, the Bible's clear. I often wondered how three times a year men will gather in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of the Lord. And for the life of me, I always thought it was going to be some kind of technological uh, way, like in Star Trek, you walk into a machine and it beams you to a, another place. But now I'm realizing it's not tech, it's angels. Angels are doing that. So we see angels gathering everybody. Everybody is gathered. Now listen, folks, let me explain something to you. There are a lot of very rich people right now that have a lot of money, and they know something big is coming. They know it. And so they've spent millions and millions of dollars and built these deep underground bunkers. They've amassed a fortune. They have food, medical supplies, anything a person can possibly need to survive what's coming underground. And these people don't love the Lord. These people don't care about the Lord because in their mind, this is all they have in life. People that love the Lord already understand, if I lose my life, I'll be in heaven with Jesus. Paul said it best, to live as Christ, to die as gain, you know. These same people, after the tribulation, they're going to pop the hatch on their, on their uh, bunker. And they're going to look out and say, "Woo, it's over, we made it. And then there's big angels going to come and grab them and take them to be judged at the judgment of the nations. Or worse, the angel's the one that's going to pop the hatch and reach down and grab them and take them. In other words, there's no way you can save yourself. You need the Christ. That's the message that's being communicated. And the sooner people figure that out, the better they're going to be. All right, let's go to Daniel chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, Daniel chapter 12. We have a whole teaching in another video, I know I'm going to say that a lot, on Daniel chapter 12. But I just want to read two verses, and that's verses 11 and 12. And from the time that the sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. I've heard a lot of teaching from a lot of different people on what this passage actually means. I believe, for me, that he's referring to what we call the 75-day interval that takes place when the Lord sets his foot on the Mount of Olives in his second coming and the beginning, the actual beginning of the tribulation period. He says, from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up. That's a direct reference to the abomination of desolation that occurs when the Antichrist desecrates the temple and sets himself up as God. This happens at the midpoint of the tribulation. So now you have a target. You have a midpoint. That's when this begins. We know that the midpoint of the tribulation is exactly 1,260 days into the seven-year tribulation, which means that there's still another 1,260 days to go before the tribulation is over. Remember, the tribulation starts at the signing of the peace treaty between the Antichrist and Israel. It does not start at the rapture. A lot of people believe that the tribulation begins at the rapture. That's not true. Some people believe we're in the tribulation right now. That's also not true. What we're seeing now is all preemptory. The seven-year tribulation will last exactly 2,520 days. On the last day of the tribulation, 
Jesus will return to the earth in his glorious second coming. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this because it's the truth. When Jesus says in the Bible, no one knows the day or the hour, only my Father in heaven, that's a direct reference to the rapture. But you can know the exact day Jesus Christ comes in his second coming, if you're left behind and you know Bible prophecy. All you have to do is watch when the Antichrist signs that peace treaty with Israel and mark the day, and you can count exactly, exactly seven years or 2,520 days from the signing of the peace treaty, and Jesus Christ will return exactly 2,520 days from the exact day that that peace treaty was signed. However, in this passage in Daniel 12, he tells us that there are 1,290 days. That's an extra 30 days beyond Christ's second coming. So what does that mean? Many scholars agree that this extra 30 days is referring to the cleansing of the temple because the context pertains to the temple and the desecration of it by the Antichrist. In other words, that temple must be cleansed. And I'm not, I'm not talking cleaning like with cleaning chemicals and bleach and all that. I'm talking about ceremonially cleansed. We have to go to the Old Testament to get that. Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 describe how the Lord will establish a millennial temple during the millennial reign of Jesus. This temple will be built um, depending on where the first temple is built. There's some people that believe that the temple that will be rebuilt, what we call the third temple, will be built on the foundation of the Western Wall, or otherwise known as the Wailing Wall. And although that sounds great, there's a very good possibility that the real temple foundation is actually located in the city of David, about 400 yards east of the Wailing Wall. And that the theory is, is that the Roman garrison that was established in Jerusalem is what people are praying to, not the actual foundation wall. Now, whether you believe that or not, it doesn't matter. A temple will be built. But if they build it in the wrong foundation, I guarantee you that Ezekiel's temple will be built in the right foundation. And that's all that really matters. Just know that the fourth temple is Ezekiel's temple, which is going to be the millennial temple that will be built during the, the millennial reign of Christ. And this thing will be massive. We're talking a mile and a half square just on the foundation alone with the temple being centered. That's a whole other teaching, but the point is it has to be big if everybody on the planet is going to be visiting it three times a year. And there's a whole teaching on what that looks like in, in Ezekiel. But getting back to this passage in Daniel, the 30-day period will be a set time where the temple will be cleansed and prepared for the millennium. But then Daniel adds an additional 45 days added to the 30 days, which totals 75 days. The angel said that those righteous people who make it through the tribulation will be blessed. Now, that means that they have to pass the judgment of the nations. So let's say, hypothetically, you lead somebody or you share somebody about Jesus and they say, no, I'm not interested. Then the rapture happens. You're gone to heaven, but then they realize, oh, you were right. So they come to faith after the rapture. We call them a trib saint. And let's say just by chance that they survived the seven-year tribulation period. And let's say just by chance they were kind to other people. They came across, they helped people. They, you know, they were, they were, they were generous with their resources during the tribulation and so forth. And then Jesus returns, and they know it because they're looking on their cell phone, and they can see it, because every eye is going to see Christ when he returns. That's a direct reference to, um, to the modern technology that we have today. That will exist at the end of the tribulation. A lot of old-timers have a hard time with that, because they were taught that the glory of the Lord will fill the earth, and everybody will see Christ returning. But it's not logical. You can't, you can't be in Australia and see what's going on in, in Jerusalem without technology. So we know technology is uh, the key. And we didn't even have that information until about maybe even 20 years ago, 15 years ago. So this is relatively new. These handheld devices, uh, you know, we're looking in our phones and we're looking on our computers and we can see things happening around the world instantaneously. That's what that's referring to. And so the idea is, is that person that you uh, witnessed to got saved they're caught away by an angel to Jerusalem. They stand before the Lord and they pass the test. Now they're blessed of God because they get to go into the millennial reign. If they fail the test at the judgment of the nation, they're cast 
into Gehenna to await their final judgment at the great white throne, which is another teaching. So it's blessed, you're blessed to be, to be able to get past the, the judgment of the nations. So this speaks of an individual blessing for each surviving soul who has received Jesus during the tribulation. They're judged by Jesus at this judgment and found righteous in his sight. Praise the Lord. All found righteous in Jesus at the judgment of the nations will enter into the messianic kingdom, otherwise known as the millennial kingdom. We'll talk more about that in another session. All found unrighteous by Jesus at this judgment will be cast into hell. I'm referring to Gehenna hell, hell fire and damnation hell, um, to await a final judgment. Jesus referenced this in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. He says, And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, Dr. Tim LaHaye, or I should say the late Dr. Tim LaHaye, one of my teachers, says it this way, and I quote, This 75-day interval is a time of preparation for the millennial kingdom. Because so much of the globe will have been destroyed during the judgments of the tribulation, it is not at all surprising that our Lord will take some time to renovate his creation in preparing for the millennial kingdom, unquote. So it's not only logical, it just makes plain sense. We have a mess, we got to clean it up. So um, we'll put a chart that you can be watching as you're hearing my voice here, and you'll be able to look at this chart. And by the way, this chart comes from Chart in the End Times, by Dr. Tim LaHaye and Dr. Thomas Ice. It's a coffee book table kind of uh, book, but I highly recommend that you get it. You can get them on Amazon for about $20, $25. You can get them used, you get them new, but I highly recommend for any Bible uh, study student, especially Bible scholar or eschatology student, get this. It's in my um, syllabus for the classes that I teach because I think it's important that people have simple uh, hands-on, brief information that helps them to understand what's coming down the pike. So if you look at the chart, you can see this extra 45 days is a direct reference to the judgment of the nations, which is a judgment that is reserved for all the survivors of the tribulation. The righteous, those are the saved, as well as the wicked, those are the lost, and Jesus will be the judge. So ladies and gentlemen, you've got to know that Jesus will either be your judge or he'll be your savior. all depends on how you look at that. I should like to say to you that the second coming of Jesus is a very powerful and unprecedented event that's going to take place because Christ is coming back with a vengeance. He's coming back with a purpose. He's going to make right all the wrongs that have been made. You've been watching on the news lately, seeing all these politicians and people seemingly get away with things. Yeah, they're being exposed, but nobody's bringing them to justice. They're just being exposed for whatever reason. Some people actually think they're above the law, but I'm going to tell you something. Nobody outruns the long arm of the Lord. And when Christ returns, if the person isn't dead already, they're going to have to face him in judgment. So there's no way that even the unrighteous, as rich as they may be, can ever um, get out from under the uh, accountability of having to face the Lord one day. None of us can. And that's why it's so important that we come to understand God as our loving Heavenly Father, our personal Lord and Savior, to invite Him to come into your life, to be your Savior. It's a simple prayer, and each of us must pray this prayer. And I encourage you, if you've not made Jesus the Lord of your life, that you confess your sin, you invite Him to come into your life and to save you, and to make Him your Lord and your Savior. And be reading the Word, the Word of God, get into a good church, get into some good discipleship so you can have a better understanding of what it is that's coming down the pike. I encourage you with that. So this concludes our study on the second coming of Jesus. Again, albeit it's very brief, even though it seems like it's a little bit long, at least you have information that will help you to better understand uh, what it's going to look like when the Lord returns. God bless you so much. Feel free to um, email me at uh, gvag.net, info at gvag.net. I'd be glad to respond to as many of you as I possibly can. I always try to be interactive as I can. If you have a different view than this, that's fine. You're entitled to that. I'm a Christian. I'm a Assembly God pastor, so obviously I'm going to have that, uh, that take, and that's where I'm coming from. And so I encourage you to study God's Word and, and live your life. Be faithful to the Lord and know His return is very soon. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Bye.